Hello, everybody. I must confess, I made a terrible mistake that speaking in Paris, I would speak in French. <laughs> That's my little joy, being a French in America, to have certain occasion to speak French. Unfortunately, so my notes are in French. I will try to do a, an OK translation. So when I was asked to discuss uh, financing transition, I, I, I was really wondering what could I say that is of interest for such an audience, uh, in particular when the call is for change now. My initial temptation was to start giving a boring uh, speech about tools, about money, about uh, public-private corporations, etc. And I'm afraid you would have left the room pretty rapidly. Not only for that, but because also I think that this is not really the question. I, I don't think we can discuss endlessly about this. And I think it's important that we go into the details. But I think if we are very serious about change now and discussing the financing of the transition, we have to address the root causes of what does not work in the system that makes this conference so essential. So it's really about discussing the system, not just the symptoms. Uh, we are in 2020. That you know, not for a long time, 30 days. We are 12 years, or 13 years, or 11 years, depending on how you calculate, after the peak of the global financial crisis. We are 26 years, uh, 28 years after we decided to launch the COP cycle, a few months ahead of the COP26. And of course, we've made progress over the past 12 years on finance, over the past 26 years on the transition, but not enough, as we very well know. It has been reminded to us last week uh, in Davos by Mr. Gutierrez. We are not there on climate, and we all know this in this room. So maybe it's time to really question uh, in depth uh, both the transition mechanics and the financing mechanics. Let, let me try to discuss uh, briefly three points with you this morning to really uh, start the, the roundtable that will follow. Uh, I like history. So I, I will do a little bit of history in my first point. We view a parallel history of climate and finance over the past 30 years. What has gone well and what has not gone that well. Second, try to assess today why we can still see the glass half full. There are things done. And you, I mean, you are here and you're part of this half full part of the glass. But also uh, wonder, and that will be my last point, what do we need to, to do, to do uh, to, to fill the glass, as long as there is still a glass to fill. That's the point. So a little bit of history over the past 30 years, and I choose 30 years on purpose. 30 years ago, 30 years and two months ago, this was the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was a student at that time, and of course, I first read the article, then the book called The End of History. Francis Fukuyama, for those who have a good memory. That was uh, really the peak of the uh, Washington consensus. That was the peak of the neoliberal model. That was really the peak of the shareholder uh, value approach, Milton Friedman, you know this by art. In 1997, the business roundtable, the same business roundtable, which is an American uh, big corporate uh, group that announced a few months ago that they are definitely in support of the stakeholders' capitalism. In 1997, the business roundtable declared very strongly, this is a, a, a confirmation of the primacy of shareholder value. So the very same people that have changed their mind six months ago, for 22 years, every year, they repeated shareholder value is our mentor. That was 1997. Ten years later, 2007, beginning of the crisis, no need to discuss the in and out of the crisis, it just shows the failure of the model, the fault line of the model. We can discuss that at length. Let me highlight a few things. First, innovation. Innovation in finance had taken the wrong way. It was a crisis of innovation. Most of the innovation promoted, not to mention the subprime, the CDO, etc., had very little impact on the so-called real economy, not to mention, of course, climate transition and anything else. That's where the brain cells of the financial world were heading to, and they were heading to disaster. That's first thing, crisis of innovation. There was a crisis of regulation, uh, and it was not totally an accident, because part of the neoliberal approach was the so-called light-touch regulation. Re I mean, the market knows. And if the market knows, why bother? And that was really part of the model. It was not an accident. So we have really to think hard about this. And of course, it was a crisis of the globalization process itself. On the one hand, we had a technological globalization going very fast. We had a financial globalization piggybacking on this 
globalization going very fast as well. Legal globalization was a little behind, and obviously ethical globalization was nowhere near anything like called globalization. So this is a conjunction of this crisis of innovation, globalization, and regulation that led to the disaster we've been through. So what have we done since? I've discussed that many times, and some of you have already heard me, so we'll not repeat it. We've patched up the system. What do I mean with that? We have basically prevented the system to completely collapse. We have not repeated the mistakes of the 1930s, and as far as I know, I don't think we're on the verge of the Third World War. So that's not too bad. We are not dead. That's positive. But the big problem is that we have not started to think about what comes next. And that's where the question of financing transition is very important. In 2015, we have started to move in that direction. There were two questions that needed to be addressed. One is, at the end of the day, what type of economy do we want to finance in the 21st century? And that was a 2015 sequence. COP21 in Paris, the SDG agreement in, uh, in uh, New York in September, and less known but also very important, the Financing for Development Conference in Ethiopia in July. So we have the roadmap. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And at that time, everybody supported the roadmap. As we very well know, there is somebody who has left part of the roadmap on climate, but still, I mean, the fact that America is no longer part doesn't mean the Americans are no longer part. That's a very interesting point. But so basically, we have started to answer that question, what economy do we want? So we all agree that we need to transition to a sustainable economy. That has been signed by our presidents. Whether you like them or not, they signed it and they committed you. The second question we have not really taken into account is, OK, if we want to go there, how do we get there, financially speaking? Because as we very well know, it's great of an objective, but if you don't have the fuel to get there, or not the fuel, let's say the money to get there, you will not get there. That was a big missing hole in the 2015 conversation. That's why at that time, when I was at the World Bank, I led the documents called From Billions to Trillions. And I really wanted to give the title to the document. It was really to, to put on the table the fact that, what are we talking about? The global economy is a hundred trillion dollar economy. Most people don't remember how many zeros it means. When I ask the question, they say it's a lot. You know, but between a billion, a trillion, and a hundred trillion, nobody makes a difference. The problem is this is really hundred trillion dollar. Public transfer, north to south, the World Bank, uh, ODI, etc., hundred to two hundred billion per annum. So there is a gap. We all know that transi transiting to this sustainable economy is three, four, five, six billion per annum, trillion per annum. So how do we get there? That is a big question. So there are a lot of things that needs to be done. We have not really started. So in parallel to this financial track on climate, uh, things also have moved from Rio to COP21 to the failure of COP25, and now the big expectations on COP26. So we have this parallel track where climate has come on top of the preoccupation, sustainability has come, of, has come on top of preoccupation, and finance is, need, is still not really moving. Interestingly, though, in 2019, six months ago, I mentioned the business roundtable, they come and say, yes, we have to change. Wow, the very same people that say shareholder value is alpha and the omega of capitalism, now we need to move to stakeholder capitalism. And we had a number of initiatives, a number of books have been released. I mean, you can see Paul Collier's The Future of Capitalism, Raghuram Jajan's The Third Pillar, Progressive Capitalism, Joe Stiglitz, my own little contribution, and many others. So people start to think about this. It's interesting, that's how it started. That's how Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek started. So I think we are there. It will take time, but we have to encourage that movement. The other element in 2019 which should force us to think about this is the rate, the interest rate. Six months ago, people saw that the zero rate was uh, an aberration, a temporary ev event. Now they realize that we're there probably for 10, 20, 30 years, forever. I mean, the economy forever doesn't mean anything, but still, for a long time. So it should force us to be a little smarter than usual. If we're at zero rate, what do we do? We just stay and say, oh well, my God, this is the beginning of the end of the financial world as we know it, or do we start to reinvent it? It was very interesting to see last week, again in Davos, the convergence of all this. More than 50% of CEOs believe capitalism doesn't work anymore. Interesting. Climate has become the number one worry for most of the people. But at the same time, people realize, as, as Gitur has said, well, okay, you all think it's very important, you all think it doesn't work, but we don't do anything. So then you have this flurry of new commitments and big announcements, etc. We'll see. But that's why I'm very happy to be here at Change Now. Because Change Now is really what, the, what is the name of the game. Change 
and now? Are we in a dead end? Or is there really something happening today? So that's where, uh, let, let me be positive first and see what is in the glass that makes it half full. First of all, I don't think there is any more real room for climate, deni climate change denial. I mean, I think most people agree that, okay, this is, this is not going in the right direction. We have to do something, and there is a human problem here. Compared to 10 or 20 years ago, that's a positive. I mean, the, the minds are, are set, not just my kids, but everybody. Second, there is still what we call with Mark Carney five years ago, a silent revolution going on in finance. And you're part of this. I'm trying to also be part. There is financial innovation, which for this time is going in the right direction. It's not just the green bonds. It's not just the ESG. It's not just impact investment. Uh, it's all the initiatives that are taken every day. The TCFD on, on climate disclosure. Even the big statement of BlackRock or State Street. I let you comment. But everything, everything is, is really, there. I've seen over the past six months, something is happening. Tough to qualify, but still, it's positive. In particular, and I, I, I like, and I might come back on this, in particular in a world where you can be held accountable for what you sign. Because people say, okay, this business roundtable thing doesn't mean, a, this doesn't mean a lot. It's a piece of paper, they give their signature because their peers have given their signature. It's worth nothing. Yes and no. Yes, we can argue it's very vague and general, but you put your name on a piece of paper, if you do the opposite three years down the road, people will say, hey, you signed this, etc." you can have a campaign, you, you put your, your, your reputation at risk. So you, you cannot be too benign with what you sign. And there is also, as I said, new, new uh, people, new, new approaches, like what blue like an orange, what, what I've created with some of my people and partners in this room. Uh, like uh, what Sofia, who I've known for many years, has presented before. So there is something happening. There is also a growing consensus on the public side for the price of carbon. Also, I mean, let's see the green deal in Europe, etc. More interestingly, there is also, I come back to the zero rate environment, there is an open discussion started in particular by Olivier Blanchard, with whom I've been working and is still working with us, the, the former chief economist of the IMF, who say, hey, this zero rate, Government should borrow money to do the right thing, including moving on climate transition. If we don't do it at zero rate, how do we do it? So it's not an easy solution. Is 100% the new 60% within the mass twist uh, mental framework? Can we push the debt? Is it smart or stupid? These are questions that need to be part of the discussion here. So that's really uh, where I think we should uh, start to push and engage this conversation. It's not taboo. And interestingly, there was in the US Congress yesterday, so we are really on top of the news, a bipartisan. It's very important, bipartisan. It's so rare that it, it's worth noting. A bipartisan discussion on how to mobilize public finance to finance climate transition in the US. What can we do? Again, it's very early, in very early stage. But people really understand that something needs to be done and that we need to really think out of the box. So that's why the, the glass is still, I believe, half full. But just half full. What about the empty half? Most of what I've described is still based on goodwill, individual commitment, etc. It's great. Our energy is great. Commitments are important. But there are limits to commitments. How do you test them? Somebody say, I'm going to put 100 billion in that Who is going to check two years down the road that 100 billions are there? That's an important question. Commitments are fragile. If the CEO says, I'm going to do that, and then there is an issue, the CEO gets out, it might change. And on top of that, commitments are also uh, opening the door to people which are less sincere and might do some washing. Green washing, or as we say now, rainbow washing. So that's, that's really this, this issue. So can we change the world just only with goodwill and, and, and commitment? I don't think so. And that's where uh, I think we have a particular responsibility in this room. I don't think that by just changing at the margin, we will change the system. We need to, uh, to go into the heart of the system. We need to open the hood, open the engine, and really put our hands in and change see what needs to be reset, redesigned, etc. That's, that's really, uh, for me, my conviction. If we are incapable of addressing the systemic issue, 
financing transition will still remain at the margin and will take too much time given the emergency. And that's really uh, basically coming back to Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman says the social purpose of business is profit, as we very well know. Everybody discussed that. Again, last week in Davos, say, oh, it's bad. After having said it's great for 50 years. Uh, what people forget is that Milton Friedman, in the very same article, say you have to take into consideration social ac acceptation. He was not that, you know, up in the air. We tend to forget the footnote on social acceptation, and we say, yeah, profit for profit. We have to move to what Colin Myers, the former dean of the Business School of Oxford, say. The social purpose of business is to find profitable solution for this planet and its people. It's not saying that profit is bad. It's profit is a means to an end, not an end to an end. So profit will be sustainable if you provide solution for this planet, because there is no other planet, and for the people. It's not profit as an end for itself. So that's what I've said to, to be a little provocative when I speak to people coming from the accounting world. We have to move from a world where we are marked to market, technically speaking, to a world where we are marked to planet. And my kids, which start now to understand what daddy thinks, say you should say hashtag mark to planet, it's way better. So I say hashtag mark to planet. Or to be more direct, we have to revise our models, not just because the zero rate forces us to rethink our financial approach, but because we really have to move in another direction. So for many years, we have been working on the risk return approach. That's how the private equity business has been built. That's how all the, the way we assess the value of financial assets is built. Venture capital. So the risk return is really the way we think about finance. And again, I want to pay homage to Ronnie Cohen and others. We've discussed that many times. In the 21st century, we have to combine risk, of course, return, of course, and something which you can call impact, sustainability, taking into account this planet and its people. It's not that difficult. I mean, everybody speaks about the IRR. I think it's a great tool. People say, yeah, the IRR is X percent. And they tend to forget that behind this X percent, there are huge calculations to get there. So we have to complexify a little bit and take into account this dimension. It's absolutely doable. We have to start working. I think in one minute I will go a little faster. It means we have to start working with the academic world, working on the principles, working on the models, how to incorporate externalities and all of these things. It started. It's not going fast enough, but it started. We have also to push international organizations in that direction. I've tried to do that with the World Bank. There are things to be done and things that still need to be pushed. And we also have to find really a way to, to work on accounting principles, fiduciary duties, legal framework, reporting, disclosing, compensation policy. I know it's very difficult to mobilize a head of state to discuss accounting principles. It happened 20 years ago. Chirac was probably the only and last one president to say, what are the IFRS? What are we doing? I think it's time to really understand that all these tricky details of day-to-day -day capitalism needs to be discussed. The question today is that to discuss that, you need a master of the world. We say, let's switch the system. And the problem is that contrary to the 70s, there is no master of the world. There is no Reagan and Thatcher. There is a fragmented world. And so, how do we get there? If there is no master of the world, there is no magic touch to change. So we have to find short circuits. That's how we worked uh, on, on the one planet with Paul Polman and others. Say, okay, we cannot change the system. Let's focus on fashion. Let's focus on maritime transportation. Let's focus on certain areas of finance. Try to agree with a group of people, reach a tipping point, and change. Is it my favorite solution? No, but there is no other thing on the table as far as I know. So it's going beyond the individual commitment and bring together a group of people, expecting that this group of people will have an impact on the system itself. I think I believe in the market economy, and that will be my conclusion. I believe in the market economy. I think the best system we have invented to take into consideration the scarcity of resources, to allocate scarce resources. But the market economy, if you don't drive it, will choose a fast lane like water, it goes straight and down. But if you force it, it can go in the right direction. And how do you force it? Playing the market, the customers, the, the people working for the companies, the investors, etc. We can put pressure. And again, look at that, the 30,000 interns, interns in front who say, I don't want to work for these companies. That's how you put pressure on this. It will take time, but it's important. But the other end, you have to, to work on regulation, transforming the system itself. So if you have the proper regulations, proper market pressure, market economy will deliver. I mean, it doesn't need to think about what it does. So that's really where we have to push. So I think, despite the glass still being half empty, despite what I've 
probably given the feeling to be a little pessimistic. I'm still optimistic. We've got the money. We never had as much money. I would say even free money today. We've got the technology. We got the pressure from the millennials and many others. We have the EU, we have the G7, we have the G20, we have the UN, we have the World Bank. We don't need to reinvent all of this. We have to make this work. It's probably easier said than done. But the point is, we don't have that much time. So I've been raised as a French technocrat, meaning I'm a very incrementalist person. Let's do things step by step, etc. But I've become revolutionary. I think we're at a moment where the tensions in the system are such that if you don't do something revolutionary, it doesn't mean that if you don't do the revolution, there is a nuance, we not get there. Let me quote to end Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was present in the US in 1901 at a moment where actually there were a number of very similar pressure in the system. And Theodore Roosevelt, so he was at creating the national park system, for instance, uh, was at the origin of the creation of the Federal Reserve, etc. Theodore Roosevelt said, I'm not advocating anything extraordinary. I'm not advocating anything revolutionary. I'm advocating action to prevent anything revolutionary. And that's what we have to do. Let's organize a revolution before the revolution takes us out. Thank you very much.